First of all, <coughs> I'd like to say a very big thank you to Ike and Chiwe for organizing this event and for, giving, for inviting me to share my own story with you. In the next 20 minutes or so, I would like to share with you my memories of a country that I grew in, a country which gave me so much, a country which did so much to help me lay a solid foundation, and a country that has helped me in shaping what I have become today. The country I wish to talk about is in West Africa. It has a population of more than 140 million people, which means that by definition, one in four or five Africans is from that great country, which means that, a, that the country, that the population of that country is about the size of a quarter of the whole of Europe. And in terms of size, it's about the size of the whole of Western Europe. The country I wish to talk about today is called Nigeria. The Nigerian society I was born into and grew in was community spirited in every sense of it. Everyone in the community looks after each other. It was normal to get your parental guidance from someone older in the community. Your success was their success. Your failure was theirs too. If you offended, you were reprimanded for your transgression. And if you did well, you were praised by everyone in the community. And on a very, very good day, you were rewarded. My parents got regular feedback on me and my siblings from our neighbors. And they took those comments seriously. They took them seriously because honor and reputation, the name of the family was far more important to them. So any behavior that would bring this repute to the family was completely unacceptable. It was a taboo to steal. It was a bigger taboo to be known to be corrupt. It wasn't a crime to be rich. To have money was important. But what was far more important was the way you got that wealth and what you did with it as an individual. I recall that from the age of 12, I received a special birthday present from my mother on every birthday. And that birthday present was a letter. I received that letter from her on every birthday until she passed away. That letter is normally about eight to 10 pages. And it contained, and I'm sure she must have been writing, and I know she writes those letters over three to four months. I am one of seven children, and every child got that letter on their birthday. That letter contained what we did well throughout the year, and what we, what we would do differently or better going forward. That was the generation my parents created for us. Every letter ended up with two sentences. Remember the home you have come from. 
and everything that glitters is no gold. So it was a society where everyone knew that you shall do nothing to bring disrepute to the family name. Where service of others was the order of the day, where honor mattered. It was a society where we saw each other as Nigerians first, and that was enough to unite us. It was unimportant whether he was called Musa, or he was called Obi, or he was called Iyabo. We were one and we behave like one, like one Nigeria. Diversity is a new word, but if you want to apply diversity to, to, the, to the context, then it was known and regarded as good and was well celebrated. Education was very important, and as my good friend here said, Nasir Erufai, the quality of education was quite high. A mother, uneducated or illiterate, would sell her belongings, would become a petty trader to send her child to school because education was important. The community would contribute money to send their best and brightest people to go to school, to go to university, and they came back to serve that community. There was no bond. They didn't have to sign an agreement. They had to come back because if they didn't, it would reflect badly, not only on them, but on their families. The control system was there, and it worked. Our teachers were well trained, but they were trained locally. They were committed and highly, highly regarded in the society. And as Patrick said in that video, they were leaders transforming the lives of this young generation. Which was why I said, whatever I am today came from there. The seed, the foundation was laid in that country by those teachers who gave so much. Their success was a success of the students they had. I went to secondary school in Nigeria. I went to a school called Christ School, Ado Ekiti. The school was known for its academic and is still known for its academic excellence. But there was heavy focus on values, on culture, on effective leadership, on the tools you needed to succeed in life. You were reprimanded when and if you offended. But dishonesty was the greatest offense. And the punishment was suspension, which meant you were sent home to tell your parents that you told a lie in school. That was how the dishonesty was taken so seriously. When I left secondary school, I went to university. And this time again, I went to the University of Ibadan. I went there because that was the natural thing to do. And as Nasir said, in our time, <coughs> those who excelled academically went to Nigerian universities. Those who went abroad failed the exams or did not have the required qualification to get into the Nigerian universities. The education was very high. When I was in UI, I had schoolmates, university mates from the rest of Africa, from the United States, because the quality of education was so high. And just to confirm that whatever I'm saying is the truth, if you look around today, 
Look at this, some of the most accomplished Nigerians in Nigeria or in the diaspora, you will find that they all went through the same educational system. Nasir Arufai went to ABU. No Ribad went to ABU. Professor Lupon of Harvard University went to Unsuka University and to Ife. Professor Marafa of Chinese University in Hong Kong went to ABU. Professor Akiwande at MIT went to GCI and went to Ife. Bayo Gulisi, who was the vice chairman of CSFD, now the head of the Global Infrastructure Fund that has just acquired Gatwick, went to KC. Dele Ologede, the 2005 Pulitzer Award winner, went to Ife. If you look around, these people benefited from that strong educational system. So we had it. Traveling around was mainly by road, and it took longer, but it was safe then. I recall traveling from Lagos to Lokoja at the time in the north, now in Kogi State, and then going on to, by ferry to Shintaku. How many of you here know Shintaku? <laughs> I went on a ferry from Lokoja to Shintaku. Why? Because I wanted to see the point at which River Ninja and River Benue became one. <laughs> Historic, it's very important. But what I want to share with you was that yes, the trip was enjoyable, illuminating. I learned so much from doing it. But on the wayside, from Lagos to Lokoja, of course you went to Ibadan. You went through Elisha, you went through uh, uh, Kaba, you went through Okene, you went through all these places. It was normal to see stacks of produce along the wayside, of yam, of plantain, of banana, and all that, stacks of, uh, along, along the wayside. Most of the sheds were not manned by anyone, but it was also normal to see passers-by, fellow travelers stop, and pick their plantain, pick their banana, and on, on it you see the price. You pay, and if you needed the, the change, you got the change there, you, but you paid the correct amount without the seller in sight. Such was a trust in my country at the time. The economy was based on agriculture before we discovered oil. We had enough to eat. We had enough to export. We had cocoa. We had cotton. We had palm oil. We had granite. We had cassava. Everyone knows that a good society needs to have strong institutions. We did have strong institutions in those days. The police force was effective and strong enough. In fact, you had the federal police and then you had the local government authorities, police also for us. The civil service, now say has said so much about the importance of public service and civil service. The civil service was indeed one of the strongest institutions in that country. This was because we had educated, competent, and effective civil servants in the country. So it did work. That was in Nigerian society that my parents and their generation created for us. That was a society. I and my generation lived in and green. Sadly enough, that is not a society our children have inherited, lived in, and they know today. So what happened? Of course, it is very easy 
to blame previous governments. And yes, they do have the share of the blame, but my submission is that the reality is that at some point, we all, we all failed to live up to the high standards set by our own parents and their generation. We all failed woefully to live up to the high standards set by our teachers who taught us and brought us up. And for decades and decades, we all failed to take responsibility. But we can fix it, and we can fix it now, because we had it before. That is why I went so far to describe the society I knew, the society I dreamed, because it's not alien to us. We were not born like it, it wasn't so before. We went to sleep. There's something wrong going to sleep, but when you sleep, it's just normal that you wake up. And when you wake up, then you go back to do what you should have done. The time to wake up has come. And we can do it because it has been done before by our parents and their gen generation. Yes, other nations have achieved some success in transforming their own countries and their own economies. For example, China was poorer than sub-Sahara Africa as recently as 1980. But between 1985 and 2000, the, its GDP per capita rose by about 500%. In the, in the early 1970s, Malaysia, and Nigeria had similar GDPs. But by 2000, Malaysia's GDP had risen five times more than Nigeria's. And for those of you who have been to Singapore and have read a lot, you also know that Lee Kuan Yew did transform Singapore from a third world nation to a first world nation with very, very limited resources. Yes, over 30 years, but it did happen. You were seeing progress every year. And I hate to say this, but I do say this because it is the fact that President Olusegun Obasanjo, I tend to say Olusegun because I share the same name with him. <laughs> because I am Olusegun Aganga as well. And in fact, when he met me, uh, I, and someone, I think Nasser was introducing me to him and said, Shegun, say blah, 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 blah. And he said, yeah, it has to be blah, 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 because it's Olu Shegun as well. So we share something in common. But the point I want to make is that President Olu Shegun Obasanjo and his cabinet of reformers, including people like Ngozi Okonjo-Wela, O.B. Ezekwe Sili, the current Minister of Information, Dora. People like Nuhu Ribadu. People like Nasir Erufai. They showed us what can be done in that country within three years. Every Nigerian, whether you are home or abroad, saw progress and felt that progress. So when people say that they've given up, it's not in my generation, they are lazy and they can't think. Because in fact, we have seen it. It was within three years, that country was transformed. And that, that tells you what good, effective, values-based, transformational leaders can do over a short period of time. What you need is the opportunity to get those leaders there. But today, I'm not talking about just living into government. You and I, as we're seated here today, we are leaders. You are leaders in your own right. And as Patrick said, when he talks about leadership, it's about the elitists. 
you and I have a responsibility and we have a duty to help transform that country and our cabinet. Despite the difficulties, the long-term potential remains very intact. It has, the country has the potential to have economic size, economic size of global significance, to be a top 20 economy. But to realize this potential will take much more consistent effort, reform, and more importantly, transformational leaders, which is why this session is very, very important. Yes, you may say Malaysia and Singapore are smaller countries and may not have the same complexities which we have created for ourselves. But they had leaders who had vision, who had a dream to make their country truly great. They were, they were pragmatic and they had very, very strong values. In next sense, they exhibited what you like to describe as values-based leadership. And that is what our continent and our country needs today. That was why Peter Riley of the Aspen Institute in Colorado and fellow Africans like Ali Mufuruko of Tanzania, Isaac Shunge of South Africa, Ken Ofori Atta of Ghana, Ndidi Ewenelu of Nigeria, all came together and set up this African Leadership Initiative. There are different leaders, but a true leader must have a vision and a determination to see it true in addition to the ability I must have the integrity to inspire and motivate their followers to realize their goal their, their, and their own vision. That was why in 2006, I and a number of Nigerians, including Dr. Kusuva Koladi, who was a former High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, people like Nasir Rufai, Nuri Badu, Oban Zube, and GD Olariraj is here, we all came together to set up what we call the Nigerian Leadership Initiative, which, starts with, which is NLI. NLI is a member of the Aspen Global uh, Leadership Network. But what we do is we bring together some of the most accomplished Nigerians in Nigeria, in the US, in the UK, in Europe, together and the idea is they go through a residential program, seminar, which takes about three to four days, uh, which the program is designed for the senior class designed and moderated, moderated by the Aspen Institute. And for the, for the fellow, for the associates, it's designed and moderated by the senior fellows. But the idea is for them to think about what is a good society and what is their role in creating that good society. And at the end of that seminar, each must undertake to carry out a personal project or, or we actively we encourage them to actively participate in class projects that would help transform Nigeria or Nigerian universities or Nigerian communities. And that is what NLI is all about. As leaders, most of these people are in positions of responsibility and influence. And we expect them to live those values every day, wherever they are. And it's part of our responsibility to help and support them and make sure that they succeed in whatever they do. Because if they succeed, we all benefit as a country. After all, we all share in that sovereign goodwill. So as Nigerians, you must understand that we are all part of that problem. And it's important for you and I to step out and be part of the solution and take responsibility to drive the much needed transformation our country and our continent needs today. 
Our country, Nigeria, as you know, is hugely endowed with human and natural resources. The assets are there, and all we need is good managers to manage those assets and generate consistent, strong, and positive returns. If you think about it, you will realize that the point I'm making is that you and I can make a difference. You and I are leaders and followers, and therefore we have a role to play. It is important that we make the move from being successful to being significant. It's important we make the move from blaming the system to actually taking responsibility. Today, our great country cries for help. The great continent of Africa cries for help. Let it not be said that we are that generation who had the cry of a mother, but looked away helplessly and walked the other way. You and I can make that difference. Thank you so much for listening.